Hello and welcome to Building Relationships course. No one questions that making friends is a good thing. In this course, you are going to discover that the business is making friends and the business of all sales professionals is making friends and building relationships. Strategic friendships will make or break any business, no matter how big and no matter what kind of market. So, in this course, our learning points will include Discover the benefits of developing a support network of connections. Understand how building relationships can help you develop your business base. Learn how to truly like your acquaintances, not just pretend to. Identify the key elements in strong working relationships and how you might put more of these elements in your working relationships. Recognize the key interpersonal skills and practice using them. Once again, welcome on board. I wish you a happy learning and let's get started. How to get people to like you. Being likable sells. In a good way, it does. There are no rules when it comes to popularity. However, these 12 rules of likability are very true. Just stop and think for a moment about how true these are in your own life and you will understand their universal appeal. 1. We like people who like us. 2. We like people who are like us. 3. We like people who can teach us without preaching at us. 4. We like people who lift our spirits. 5. We like people who pay attention to us. 6. We like people who are approachable. 7. We like people who are genuine. 8. We like people who we associate with positive feelings. 9. We like people who are courteous. 10. We like people who we are familiar with. 11. We like people who don't take themselves too seriously. 12. We like people who are beautiful on the inside. The choices other people make about you determine your health, wealth, and happiness. And decades of research prove that people choose who they like. They buy from them, hire them, marry them, and spend precious time with them. The good news is that you can arm yourself for the contest and win life's battles for preference. How? By raising your likability factor. It's all about increasing your capacity to deliver emotional benefits to others in every interaction. So, here are the six levels of likability. 1. Authenticity. Meaning, you're the real deal. No ulterior motive other than you help others help themselves that in turn help you, whether you're looking for a job, hiring folks, or managing them. 2. Truthfulness. Meaning, you're not full of lies, period. 3. Trustworthiness, meaning that you're dependable and do what you say you'll do. 4. Personableness, meaning you're courteous and kind for the most part with everyone you interact with and, for goodness sake, have some kind of sense of humor. 5. Accessibility, meaning you're willing to give of yourself, however big or small, when someone needs your advice or help. Six. Reciprocity, meaning it's about helping each other achieve some kind of goal, getting and giving a referral, an interview, a promotion, career advice, mentoring, critical feedback. When you improve these areas and boost your likability factor, you bring out the best in others, handle life's challenges with grace, enjoy better health, and excel in your daily roles. You can lead people more effectively, make more sales, and be more influential with others. Go ahead, smile, say something nice, repeatedly, be humble and self-deprecating, share positive affirmations like you're a celeb, post pictures of your happy kids, share relevant information to those around you that's actually helpful to them personally and professionally, not negative and condescending. What influences people in forming relationships? Welcome back. Today, let's look at the influences at work. The secret to success is not very hard to figure out. The better you are at connecting with other people, the better the quality of your life. Is there a natural talent for getting along with people, or is it something we can learn? Connecting with other people brings infinite rewards, but it is hard work, too. Connecting is what our ancestors were doing thousands of years ago when they worked together and hunt down their food and then gathered around the fire to eat woolly mammoth steaks. Here are some of the influences at work when we connect with others. Appearance. This is the extent to which physical attractiveness plays a role in helping us form favorable first impressions of another person. Physical attractiveness is very subjective. 
although there are some standards we can count on. Similarity. Individuals are drawn to one another when they share common interests or goals. Common ground is just that, finding some areas of similarity with another person. We took some time earlier today to find common ground with other people in this room. Finding common ground can be an important part of relationship building. Let's look at a few more things that influence how you connect with people. Complementarity. People may be attracted to others who fulfill a particular need at a particular time in their lives. If you know their needs and you can fulfill these needs with your own talents or with your products or services, it is easier to create an interest in what you offer. Think back in your life to times when you became friends with someone because of circumstances or needs. Reciprocity. This relates to our tendency to repay others in kind for what they have given us. Dale Carnegie once described life as a boomerang. You get what you give. Competence. People can be influenced by the knowledge and skill people bring to a situation. Certainly, it is important to be seen as knowing what you are doing. Testimonials from others who have used your services can provide proof of your competence. Proximity. The sheer chance of physical location determines to a large degree those with whom we do business. On the whole, proximity allows us to gather more information about others and to benefit from a relationship with them. According to research, we are more apt to form relationships with people who live in our community, our city, our province, or our state. This is good news in one way. We don't have to conquer new territories. We can build strong relationships right on our own home turf. However, with the advent of the Internet, we do have access to, and virtual proximity to, a far greater geographical region than ever before. Exchange. In differentiating exchange from reciprocity, a person must determine whether working with another is a good deal or a wasted effort. It suggests we seek people who can give us personal rewards equal to or greater than the costs we face in dealing with them. In economics, this is called the exchange theory. These components of interpersonal attraction influence us in our social as well as our professional lives. Most people do not have a choice when it comes to the people they work with. Although these determinants often determine the degree to which they appreciate and nurture those relationships. So they may choose to exercise these factors to a greater extent when they feel they are in the driver's seat as a buyer. Hello there. Today we will talk about disclosure. Disclosure includes the degree to which we are willing to be authentic with others and share appropriate information about ourselves. There are two major ways of becoming more self-aware. The first involves listening to yourself in order to understand how you are reacting or feeling and what is causing your reactions or feelings. When we discuss our fears, you are really being asked to be more aware of your own self-talk or self-esteem. We have a tendency to ignore our reactions to the world around us, but we can make our feelings and reactions more conscious if we work on this. The second way of becoming more aware is to request feedback from other people as to how they see you and how they are reacting to your behavior. Joe Luft and Harry Ingraham developed the Johari Windows concept. This concept is a way of looking at our self-awareness and our ability to ask feedback of others. The window illustrates their point that there are certain things you know about yourself and certain things that you don't know. Similarly, there are certain things others know about you that you may or may not know, and there are certain things that they don't know. They make the assumption that it takes energy to hide information from yourself and others, and that the more information is known, the better and clearer communication will be. Building a relationship often involves working to expand your open, free, or known-to-self and others window, while decreasing your blind and hidden areas. As you become more self-disclosing, you reduce your hidden area and give other people more information to react to, thus reducing your blind area. As you encourage others to be more self-disclosing with you, your blind area is further reduced. As you reduce your blind area, you increase self-awareness and this helps you to be even more self-disclosing with others. The Johari Windows concept has been taken further in its application. The degree of trust and respect a person shows results in a style of human relations that has been characterized by a turtle, an owl, a bull in the china shop, and a picture window. The names of these styles of people and relationships are quite indicative of how they operate. So, first and foremost, a turtle low trust and low respect. This type of person is reluctant to express ideas or feelings to others and equally reluctant to listen to others. 
Whether meaning to or not, the turtle communicates low trust in the motives of others and low respect for their opinions. The result is a large region of the unknown. Misunderstandings, frustration, untapped creativity, and unsolved problems lie in this region. People who have turtle relationships find them cold, impersonal, and unsatisfying. Just as partners may experience turtle relationships, so may whole groups. Turtle relationships may exist between work groups, between management and employees, or between an organization and its public. Such communities are characterized by low morale and poor performance. Turtle relationships can be improved if people are willing to listen to the ideas and feelings of others and are willing to openly express their own ideas and feelings. One can start this process, but it takes two to improve a turtle relationship. Someone must initiate and the other must respond. The next type is an owl, high respect and low trust. The owl style of human relations is better than the turtle because respect is shown toward the opinions of others. The owl gives time and attention, thus showing concern for ideas and feelings. However, when someone listens but does not share ideas and feelings in return, a facade develops with two corresponding drawbacks, an impression of role-playing and insincerity and the suppression of conflict, with a resulting decrease in creativity and problem-solving potential. The owl avoids self-expression and relies too much on listening. Ultimately, this is not satisfying for either partner because the relationship is one-sided. The solution is to demonstrate trust in others by becoming more self-expressive. It takes two to improve an owl relationship. The owl gradually must become more open. This takes time, because change can be difficult to accept and dealing in honest self-expression and confrontation can be threatening. As well, the owl's partner must show respect by listening as ideas, hopes, goals, and feelings are shared. The other type is a bull in the china shop, high trust and low respect. The bull in the china shop is like the owl, one-dimensional. The good part is the bull is open and honest with feelings and ideas. Whether they are right or wrong, popular or not, you always know where bulls stand. By open self-expression, the bull says, I trust you and believe you will not use what I say to hurt me. This is the good part. The bad part is the enormous blind spot the bull creates by not listening to others. Perhaps unintentionally, the bull is demonstrating that other people's feelings and ideas are unimportant. Whether the bull in the china shop style develops as a result of ego striving, natural aggressiveness, or actual superiority, it is often destructive in human relationships. The blind spot typically contains negative data, the frustration and resentment of others that may one day erupt. Negative feelings could also be turned inward and result in low self-esteem for the bull's partner and friends. The solution is for the bull in a china shop to become a better listener. The bull must come to realize that others want to express themselves too. People who rarely ask for others' opinions or listen to their problems have a bull in the china shop style of human relations and they have a large blind spot. By listening, they can reduce this blind spot and improve the quality of their relationships at work and at home. Next one, a picture window, high trust and high respect. The most effective style of human relations is characterized by dialogue and it is symbolized by the picture window. With this style, people show mutual respect as each listens to the ideas and feelings of others and they demonstrate interpersonal trust as ideas are shared openly and honestly. The region of the known is the dominant feature of picture window relationships. What goes on in this area is candid discussion and free-flowing ideas about issues, events, and experiences. By no means is dialogue tame. Indeed, diverse points of view and values sometimes clash. Conflict is viewed positively. However, as all parties recognize they are not identical twins, that disagreement is natural and that out of diversity can come increased creativity and satisfaction. Picture window relations are characteristic of true feelings of community and develop common ground between you and other members of the group. How to Win Friends and Influence People One of the most popular books ever written was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. He first wrote the book in 1936, and after many reprints, it was reissued again in 1998. It's a classic that has stood the test of time because it works. Carnegie was born in 1888 and died in 1955. He was a salesman and he was a pioneer in teaching public speaking and controlling stress. 
he strongly believed in a theory called responsibility assumption. In other words, you can change other people's behavior by controlling how you react to them. Let's go back and revisit some of Carnegie's basic principles, because he touches directly on how we connect with people. Self-awareness is the first step toward understanding yourself and making a choice as to whether you wish to change certain current patterns of behavior to more productive ones. Quote by Dale Carnegie. Talk to people about the things they are interested in. So, here are the techniques in handling people. 1. Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. 2. Give honest and sincere appreciation. 3. Arouse in the other person an eager want. Now, let's look at six ways to make people like you. 1. Become genuinely interested in other people. 2. Smile. 3. Remember that a person's name is to that person the sweetest and most important sound in any language. 4. Be a good listener. Encourage others to talk about themselves. 5. Talk in terms of the other person's interests. 6. Make the other person feel important, and do it sincerely. Next, how to win people to your way of thinking. 1. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. 2. Show respect for the other person's opinions. Never say, you're wrong. 3. If you are wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. 4. Begin in a friendly way. 5. Get the other person saying yes, yes, immediately. 6. Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. 7. Let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. 8. Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. 9. Be sympathetic for the other person's ideas and desires. 10. Appeal to the nobler motives. Be a leader. Here is how to change people without giving offense or arousing resentment. 1. Begin with praise and honest appreciation. 2. Call attention to people's mistakes indirectly. 3. Talk about your own mistakes before criticizing the other person. 4. Ask questions instead of giving direct orders. 5. Let the other person save face. 6. Praise the slightest improvement and praise every improvement. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. 7. Give the other person a fine reputation to live up to. 8. Use encouragement. Make the fault seem easy to correct. 9. Make the other person happy about doing the thing you suggest. It is naive to think that by implementing these techniques, we'll always get the outcome we desire. But the experience of most people shows that we are more likely to change attitudes with these approaches than by not using these principles. Even if we increase our success by a mere 10%, we have become 10% more effective as leaders than we were before. With practice, it will become even more natural to apply these principles every day, and soon we will be masters of the art of human relations. Nonverbal messages. Nonverbal messages are, in fact, more important than the words we say. This can include the way we stand, what we do with our hands, the sound of our voice, the way we walk, and the expressions on our face. So, today, let's look at body language. Most of our face-to-face -face communication is through body language. When we are delivering any message, only 7% of that message is our words. The rest is our tone of voice and our nonverbal body language. The face and the eyes are the most expressive means of body communication. Additional positive or negative messages are sent by your gestures, posture, and the space between you and the other person. Body language must be in tune with your words and tone, or you send a mixed and often confusing message. Positive body language is important to supporting your words and ensuring complete understanding. So, now, let's have a look at positive versus negative messages. Positive message. Face is relaxed and under control. This communicates you are prepared, know what you are doing, and or are comfortable with your role. Negative message. Face is anxious and uptight. This communicates you are ill-prepared, inexperienced, and or uncomfortable with your role. Positive message. Smile is natural and comfortable. This communicates you are sure of yourself, like what you are doing, and enjoy your clients or guests. Negative message. Smile is forced or phony. This communicates you are unsure of yourself, 
don't like what you are doing, and or really don't enjoy your clients or guests. Positive message. Eye contact is maintained when talking or listening. This communicates they are important, you are interested in them, and you feel self-confident. Negative message. Eye contact is avoided when talking or listening to customers or guests. This communicates a lack of interest and or you lack the self-confidence to do the job. Positive message. Body language is deliberate and controlled. This communicates you are in control, you are glad to be where you are, and that although you are busy, this is just part of your job. Negative message. Body movement is harried and rushed. This communicates that you are not in control of the situation and would like the client or guest to leave. Next is your voice. Your attitude is projected through the voice as well as your body language. Make sure your body language always says, I'm here to help as best I can. When your voice is annoyed, impatient, or condescending, the other person may become angered or angrier. Speak with a calm, firm, caring, and soothing tone. Your communications will be more relaxed, more pleasant, and better understood. The speed or rhythm of your speech is important as well. Clear communication includes appropriate pauses and inflections to support the words. Here are some qualities of a good voice that you need to consider. Alert, awake and interested, pleasant, a smile in your voice, natural, straightforward language without jargon, enthusiastic, glad the person called, visited, distinct, easy to understand with moderate volume and rate, expressive, well modulated, varied tone, the skill of making small talk. Small talk has a bad reputation. Sometimes we think of it as the poor cousin to a real conversation. However, without small talk, many of us will never get to those real conversations. Small talk helps us put others at ease and make them comfortable. Small talk breaks the ice and goes a long way toward furthering a relationship. The ability to make small talk can help us build business, develop our networking skills, get friends, maintain relationships, and even find us jobs. So, if you are not good at small talk, it can lead to big disadvantages in the business world. Although commenting about the weather or the latest sports scores may seem trivial to you, having the ability to initiate, or at least participate in trivial conversations, can help you navigate networking events, open the door to attracting potential new business, and give you something to say to your own boss at corporate affairs. If you are not good at coming up with trivial topics, don't fret. We'll provide you with tips on improving your small talk skills. Show interest in the other party. The number one secret to making small talk if you are uncomfortable with it is getting the other person to talk. How do you accomplish this? By showing interest in them and asking questions. Rather than awkwardly rambling on about your long commute due to the rain, ask the other party a question to encourage them to speak. If you know who you will be meeting with in advance, it would be advantageous to do some research on them to see if you can find out any personal interests they have and then encourage them to discuss those. Use open-ended questions. When asking questions to show interest in the other party, the trick is not to ask questions that can be answered with a simple yes or no, which would put the pressure back on you to continue the conversation. Instead of asking, I heard you like to play polo, is that true? Say, I heard you play polo, what made you interested in this sport? Prepare. Mostly, small talk centers around the weather, recent events, and industry news. The problem is that it's hard to make small talk if you are not up to date on these happenings. Before you find yourself at an event with nothing to say, prepare topics to discuss related to these fields. Read or watch the news to familiarize yourself with recent local and international events to bring up. However, try and stay away from politics, as it's hard to predict what political side other people may be on. The last thing you want is to start a controversial debate at a work function. Staying current on important industry news is also helpful to have something to discuss at business events. You can accomplish this by signing up for relevant newsletters, following companies on social media, joining industry-related LinkedIn groups, etc. The more you know about the topic, the more you will have to say. Now, let's consider exit lines. No matter how seriously you try, not all conversations can be made into engaging discussions. Eventually, even good conversations may come to an end. Tell the other person how much you have enjoyed speaking with them and go on to meet other people. 
And finally, do you remember names? To use the excuse, I'm just no good with names, is just not acceptable if you want to win at the art of interpersonal relations and if you want to make the best impression you can on the people you do business with. So how do you remember names? Probably rule number one should be that you want to remember names. Think of it as a skill you are developing through practice. Some additional tips include, repeat the name after you've been introduced, then use it again as soon as possible to underline the name in your memory bank. Repetition helps. Look at the person as you say his or her name. Note anything visual about that person that will help you anchor that name in your memory. If you are given a business card at some point in the conversation, take time to look at the card and the person's name. For visual learners, actually seeing the name helps keep it in your memory. If you have a journal, get in the habit of writing down the names of the people you meet at a function or during the day. This activates your kinesthetic learning and is just one more opportunity to fix the name in your memory. Networking. The underlying principle of networking is that people prefer to do business with, to hire, or to buy from, people they know. Networking can not only help you get what you want, it can also add immeasurably to your polish and sophistication. Attending meetings of business organizations or community groups and getting to know new people gives you greater self-confidence, builds your people skills, and offers you opportunities to interact with successful business people. Networking exposes you to new ideas and helps you keep current on what is going on around you. It's important to flex your networking muscles as much as possible. Many people network only when they are looking for a job or when they first get into sales. The trick is to network constantly and to keep your contacts current so they will be there for you whenever you need them. Two things to get right include remembering names, getting your handshake right. We spoke about remembering names in our previous lesson. Do you know what are some tips for remembering names? Once you start meeting people, you should organize your network. List those people you want to contact over the next three months. Consider how much time and money you have available to devote to networking. If you don't have business cards, get some. If you collect a card, note the date you met, where, and at what event. Do you need to do any follow-up? Create a networking book. This can be a handwritten file or a computer document. Keep track of those contacts you want to cultivate. Next, let's talk about networking difficulties and how to overcome them. When I come into a room with a bunch of strangers, I look around and everybody is already talking. What do I do besides stand there and look foolish? I never know what to say to anybody I'm meeting for the first time. How do I get the conversation going? So, here are a few networking tips for you. Set a reasonable goal for the number of new people to talk with each day, and do it! At gatherings, limit the time you spend with friends and people you already know. They will probably want to network too. Prepare and rehearse a brief description of who you are and what you do Something that takes only three seconds to say. What is your message? Exchange business cards with everyone who is appropriate and interested. If you don't have business cards, get them. Make sure they know where to contact you. If they don't have cards, shame on them. At least get the name of their company and, if possible, their telephone number. Use your time effectively if you are in transit or lining up for meals at a business or social event. It is smart to network at training or organizational sessions, and some of our most interesting networking is done at meals. If you have a name tag, wear it on the upper right of your chest. This makes it easier to read when you are shaking hands. Keep Wayne Dyer's words in mind. Networking is concerned with developing relationships. Out of those relationships can come the things you want in life. Networking means sending out into the system what we have and what we know, and having it return to reciprocate continually through the network. It means giving things way without expectations. Business authority Marilyn Motes advises that networking is just another way of organizing your luck. Who you meet today may very well determine where you are tomorrow. The handshake. During the important first few minutes of a new business relationship, a handshake is usually the only body contact between two people. It can communicate warmth, a genuine concern for the other person, and an image of either strength or gentleness. It can also communicate indifference and weakness. Developing a professional handshake is perhaps one of the most valuable business skills you can ever cultivate. The message you communicate with your handshake is determined by five factors. Degree of firmness. Your grip should be firm rather than weak. 
However, you don't want your handshake to be painful to the other person. So, consideration is appreciated. Be especially considerate if you are shaking hands with someone in a receiving line who has many more hands to shake, someone who is wearing a lot of rings, or who is obviously elderly and perhaps fragile. Dryness of hand. We all prefer to shake a hand that is dry. While you typically don't want to obviously dry your hands before greeting someone, this is perfectly acceptable if you have been holding a cold glass. Similarly, if you are at the buffet table and have been eating, it is expected you would wipe your hand on your napkin before extending it to be shaken. Depth of grip. A handshake is palm to palm. Generally, you will place your hand so that the web between your thumb and forefinger meets the web of the other person's hand briefly. Your hand remains perpendicular. If your palm is facing up, this may be construed as a sign of submissiveness. Similarly, if your palm is on top, it can be seen as a sign of aggressiveness. Duration of grip. The perfect handshake is about three seconds. You can gently pump once or twice, but this is not necessary. Then pull back your hand, even if you are still talking. And of course, eye contact. While this will vary from culture to culture, in North America, we expect the person shaking our hand to make eye contact with us. Have something to say as you shake hands if possible. It doesn't require anything witty. You can even use the old standby, pleased to meet you. These few words set the stage for some small talk that can be the beginning of a new business relationship. Grasping the top of the other person's hand with your other hand so that their hand is enveloped in yours may very well signal warmth and affection. However, this may be seen as patronizing and too familiar for an introductory handshake. Save this handshake for a meeting with an old friend. Dress for success. Not long ago, everyone from the most seasoned professionals to entry-level employees had a common understanding of appropriate business attire. Thanks to the creation of the khaki culture and increasing popularity of casual Friday and business casual dress, it's no longer that simple. So how do you dress down for work or business meeting without looking like you're headed to the beach? Here are a few easy rules to live and dress by. So let's look at these main points here. Consider your work environment. If you're meeting with clients or having business lunches, try to stick to conservative style. It's a sign of professional respect and you can save the jeans for a time when you'll be in the office all day. Strive for consistency. If you wear tailored and conservative outfits Monday through Thursday, Friday isn't the day to show up like you just rolled out of bed. No matter what industry you're in, consistency goes a long way in establishing trust and credibility with all your internal and external contacts. Ask first, dress later. Show respect for both yourself and management. Be sure to check with your HR department or direct manager before showing up dressed for a barbecue. Dress to impress. It is important to know what is appropriate for your industry. Look around you and see if you can interpret the dress code levels in the area where you work. For women, if your company's idea of business casual isn't quite jeans and sweaters, pantsuits are the answer. Not only are they trendy, they can be dressed up or down. Choose a dark, natural shade like black, navy, brown, or gray, and opt for pants with a bootleg cut. Pair them with a light sweater and you'll be ready to go from your desk to a client meeting without a second thought. When jeans are the sensible choice for the work site, pairing them with a jacket or blazer can take them from the mud to the office without missing a beat. Stock up on different tops to give your wardrobe a bit of versatility. Crisp cotton shirts in white and hues like chambray and chartreuse instantly add a casual element to your dress pants or khakis. Sweater sets are also an easy way to present a softer look while still looking professional. Jewelry, scarves, and other accessories will add a polished touch to any outfit. As a female, you should remember, at work, less is more. For men, a sport coat instantly creates a pull-together look, especially in a business casual environment. It's also an ideal choice for client meetings or presentations. Pair up a black, navy blue, or dark gray blazer with khakis or dark wool pants. In addition to traditional dress slacks, khakis, dockers, corduroys, wool flannel, and linen slacks are also appropriate for the office, either with or without a blazer. Jeans can be appropriate attire on a work site, but make sure they're not torn. Keep in mind, in casual Fridays, just because it's casual day doesn't mean you can turn up in wrinkled pants. Be sure to iron them beforehand. Casual button-down Oxford shirts are a great alternative to dress shirts, with or without a tie. 
Skip the loud prints and reserve plaids for more casual times. Basic white, chambray, or pinstripes are the safest bet. Shoes are an afterthought for many men, but unkempt footwear can ruin an otherwise polished look. Oxfords and loafers in brown or black are a good match for khakis or corduroys. If your work demands sturdy boots, make sure they are clean and presentable.